my favorite people in, in philanthropy here. Um, and we're gonna process this like real time. What did we, what did we hear um, you know, together and, 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 and with you, with your, with your help? Got some questions that were submitted. Thanks for that. Um, Dick Ober is the president and CEO of the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. Um, which is the largest private provider of nonprofit grants and student aid in northern New England. Nobody has taught me more about community foundations than Dick Ober. He's been a mentor to me. He's a member of our board. So really delighted to have you here, Dick. Karen McNeil Miller is a longtime foundation leader, uh, most recently at, um, as CEO of Colorado Health Foundation, where she helps guide the foundation to determine the most impactful investment of human financial and influence capital on behalf of those in Colorado who need it most. Um, another mentor of mine and member of the CEP board is Sampriti Ganguly, who um, until very recently was, I believe for about seven years, the CEO of Arabella Advisors, which most of you know as an important uh, strategic advising firm, advising donors and um, philanthropic institutions. Um, did I say this already? Sampriti is also on our board. Um, so we're gonna, um, together just try to make sense of, of some of what we heard and, and obviously um, acknowledging that, you know, it really does feel like a very challenging moment. We sort of began uh, with that uh, statement and, and we, we heard it again in the, most, in the most recent plenary. And it's not necessarily obvious um, how to respond and what philanthropy can do. And uh, Dick, you noted to me uh, yesterday that um, that you've been thinking about a lot of tensions that we have to hold, that there's a lot of nuance here um, and uh, the need to sort of avoid the binaries. And I wondered if you could start just by sharing what was on your mind, because you kind of told me you wanted to say that, but you didn't tell me, tell me exactly what it meant. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, um, thank you so much to CEP for putting on this conference, which I hold as the best conference in philanthropy. and. Sam Pretty and I were talking, um, we hadn't had a chance to talk with Karen before, but feeling utterly inadequate to the task, given the brilliance and the insights and the experience and the artistry that we saw on this stage over the last two and a half days to try to make any sense or contribute further. So with that caveat, um, it, it feels like I've long thought about I've been in philanthropy not my whole career, about 10, 12 years, and it feels like there are these fundamental tensions within our field. And I wanna name maybe five of them that were illuminated over the course of the last couple of days. Um, this is really a high level thought, and you're probably gonna say, well, duh, but let me just play this out with you. So one, Tension, treat symptoms, change systems. Two, act today, try to be a force that's still relevant tomorrow. Three, trust and relationship and proximity to community on the one hand, empirical evidence and evaluation and analysis on the other. You could say that one is data and stories, the tension between data and stories. Four, convener and bridge builder slash principled advocate with an important point of view in a time when the world feels like it's on fire. And then the fifth, and this, I thought about this in Jacob's talk, he talked about abundance and privilege and this access to all these tools. I had like three or four in my mind and then he named nine, so that was a little bit overwhelming. But that's on the one hand, and then on the other, this period of polycrisis with these interrelated major challenges coming together. Um, and to me, that one is a little bit about breadth versus depth. So here's my thought about these today is I also feel this increasingly sophisticated understanding in our field that these are not binary. And 10 years ago or five years ago in these conversations, I felt like we were talking about them as more like tensions that somehow we had to pick one or the other. And 
I feel like at this conference, we're embracing the ambiguity, the nuance, and understanding with grace and humility, these are not resolvable tensions in our field, but perhaps there is really good work to be done in the tension between those things that somehow sometimes feel um, more binary than they are. Thanks for that, Dick. Uh, Karen or Sam Pretty, any, any reaction to any of those, those five? Um, maybe not tensions, but they can feel like tensions, yeah, but we, we have to avoid that binary. I think there's room for it all to be right. That you that I don't necessarily see them as tensions. I think you can. Um, some may be within your own strategy in the foreground, and some may be in the background, but they're all still in the frame. And I, and however you may choose, we we lean heavily towards um, community engagement, and we challenge the orthodoxies of traditional evaluation to say what constitutes evidence, who constitutes an expert, and in what, and in what, um, and in what forum, and in what way. So I think they can all, I think all those things can coexist, and I think they probably all do coexist in some way in most of our foundations. I would just add to that, I mean, I, I agree with those tensions. I, I would name a couple more that I'm sitting with for which I don't have an answer, but I think it's worth us all exploring. Um, when I entered the field of philanthropy about a decade ago, like you, I had some great mentors, and one of the things that was impressed upon me is the need to be objective. Um, is objectivity the same as being neutral? Um, because I think we are in a moment where being neutral does not always serve us and it certainly doesn't always serve the communities that we hope to support. I would posit that you can potentially be both in certain places, in certain spaces, but that requires really thoughtful consideration, and I think it is a, both a challenge and an opportunity for us. The second tension that I'm, I'm sort of sitting with uh, coming out of this uh, conference in the first session, uh, we talked about sort of some green shoots of trust-based philanthropy and trust increasing within our sector but at the same time, trust in the institution of philanthropy and in the nonprofit sector actually is decreasing. And yet it is the high, in, in many ways, uh, philanthropy or the nonprofit sector and business are the places of highest trust in our society. How do we sit and hold both of these uh, to be true? And is our bigger opportunity to increase trust broadly in our sector or of and belief in our sector? And I would just challenge us to think that maybe we need to do both. Um, and the instrument to increase trust within philanthropy is different than the instruments required to increase public trust of philanthropy. Yeah, I think that latter point is just so important. And um, I've sort of simplistically thought of this as those who get the opportunity to know organizations best tend to trust them more and somehow the broader public isn't getting that opportunity. We're not communicating that clearly enough. So you see this odd disconnect you talked about. But, but I want to talk about the, the other one that you added, um, the objectivity versus neutrality, because it also makes me think of um, something that has been um, a thread but not really a focus, um, which is the state of the sort of backlash to the focus on racial equity in our society, but also within philanthropy, uh, that began in 2020, right? And we saw these incredible pledges from all kinds of donors and companies, and, and now we have seen an orchestrated backlash. Uh, again, folks have touched on it, but I'm not sure we've gone that deep on it. Um, and then we have the differing responses right now, very differing, foundation by foundation, I can tell you, because I'm ha having the conversations, to the Supreme Court decision regarding affirmative action in higher education. I don't think any of us are lawyers, right? Um, so this is probably dangerous territory, but from those who are hearing from their lawyers, change language on your website, do things differently, and those who are 
talking to their lawyers and saying we're doubling down and we're not changing a thing and let's not be intimidated and we have an opportunity to take risk that, that others don't. And I, I wonder if, if, if the two of you who are currently leading foundations could start in terms of how are you thinking about this um, and what are, what are you seeing? So if I can, I want to back up to the, the trust piece. I would posit that some of the organizations that know us best have the healthiest distrust of us. Oh, and those are typically, I would mm -hmm. say, those are typically BIPOC-led, community-based organizations. Yeah. And they have a right to have a distrust of the field in general. Uh, to the, the equity, the Supreme Court, I think, you know, I'm going to say some things that may not be popular, but I think foundations that were planned with equity, plan at being equitable, are the ones that are, were backing up. Because they were never serious to start with. They may have been able to fool their boards. They may have been able to fool themselves, but they never can fool community. And the community already knew. So I think the f people who are really serious about equity and justice are, are talking to the lawyers, as I think we are, but it's right. like, we just want to know um, what we're saying, what we're going to not change anything for. We're not, you know, maybe you should change the language. No, we're not going to do that, but now at least we know. We know this could be challenged, and it may be, and if it is, we'll deal with it then, but we're not going to change anything in, um, in anticipation of. And so I do think that organizations that have been really serious about equity, diversity, racial justice, are doubling down and leaning in. Yeah, yeah. And, and I suppose, like, you don't have to be a student in his, of history to know that rights have not been gained through strategies that prioritize the mitigation of risk. <laughs> so uh, I'll just put it, put it that way. Uh, Dick, you, I've heard you talk a lot about this over many years in terms of um, the demographics of New Hampshire uh, and your commitment to racial equity, and then more recently, um, just how you're curious with how, you, how you're grappling with the current context. So I'm gonna start. Um with something else I've noticed over the last five or six years, and I'm gonna quote one of my new friends who I deeply admire in the community foundation field, and that's Alicia Washington from Seattle, who at a recent gathering, she said in a very natural way, she sees her foundation as a social change organization that does grant making. And that's where I feel, at least in community philanthropy, it's what I know, we can only know what we know. I'm feeling that shift really significantly now, rather than funders who dabble in social change and policy and advocacy, thinking themselves as social change organizations who have funding as one tool. That is gonna depend based on how you're structured and tax law and all of that, and there's flexibility that a community foundation as a 501c3 can do that a private foundation can't. So with that, our perspective on equity and racial justice, and again, here's my experience. A small, rural, mostly white state, but also one that is, has a growing, vibrant, terrific community of brown and black neighbors throughout our state. And we have a single purpose. I was thinking of Faye Torsky uh, being cited from this stage a couple days ago. Um, um, we have a single purpose, and that is to make New Hampshire a more just, a more sustainable, and a more vibrant community where everyone can thrive. And what that leads us to is who is not thriving and why not, and then that leads us to centering equity, racial justice, and economic security, and deep community engagement. Um, not, I'm not going to say not even, but almost because we are a state that is primarily white and is seeing the tremendous assets and benefits of trying to become a more welcoming and inclusive place. I 
been doing a little tour race recently and trying to, cause so we get, we get dinged. Um, Dick, you're sounding like you're political. You're using these phrases that are like um, political and polarizing and partisan. And my answer is they're not. The debate is shift, we haven't. I mean, to me, equity and justice and opportunity are the central principles of our way far from perfect union. And I've gone back into some of the incorporating documents of my foundation 60 years ago. Words and those concepts were built into it. So when there's this backlash, our board and our st staff are actually standing up straighter and rejecting that somehow that we are on this mission, this is our mission, this is our purpose, and if anything has changed, it's the nature of the debate, not our principled uh, focus. And, and arguably, it's a, both a disinformation and an intimidation tactic to say that words are somehow political or carry some partisan connotation you know, at the level of in a breakout that I was moderating yesterday, a leader of a, of a organization saying, you know, they're increasingly, and this is an equity focused organization working with girls, they're increasingly getting pushback on the words equity, mm -hmm. on the words social and emotional health of young people. I mean, and so like we're supposed to shift the language, right? That, that's, a, that's a tactic to subjugate, I think, ultimately. Um, Sam Preet, I know you've thought a lot about this and you're worried. Yeah, so. two things that, that I would just add. I, I, um, knowing that this is a large tent of organizations and knowing that it may be hard for some of us to make sort of bold statements and commitments, um, one of the things that I would just offer is um, if you can't make a statement, if you can't join a coalition, make sure that you are funding tactics that help support BIPOC-led organizations that are now on the front lines of this litigation. Support litigation uh, efforts, for example. Support crisis communications that will be necessary and required. If you can't put your, uh, uh, if you can direct your funding dollars, um, uh, I would urge you all to do that. It is the gravest disservice to the communities that we are trying to lift, and quite frankly, the leaders who we have brought up over the last three to five years to not support them in this particular moment. Um, so that would be one of the calls to action. And then maybe just a reminder for those of us who are sort of the history geeks in philanthropy, um, in 1965, uh, the law was changed to limit what foundations could do, uh, the 501c3 statutes, in part because of philanthropy's support of the civil rights movement. So our laws have already been shown to restrict what we can do to fight and challenge and speak truth to power. So I would just encourage us while we are trying to stay within those bounds to also interrogate why it is that we are limited in the first place and continue to expand the perimeter of what is possible. Thanks. Sam Preeti, I saw you in a hallway yesterday and um, you said great conference uh, and I've been thinking about what hasn't been discussed and who isn't in the room. And rather than saying, what do you mean? We decided we would talk about it here. So I don't, I, I'm curious to hear your answer. Yeah, so I'll answer maybe with um, three Ds. Um, the first D I'll start with is demographics. Um, and I wanna celebrate and acknowledge that we've made a lot of progress in key areas. We heard through the research, for example, um, that in the donor collaboratives that we've supported, there is more representation uh, uh, than we see in traditional philanthropy. But I just wanna do a quick show of hands. How many people in this room are under the age of 23? Under the age of 23, okay. So here we are, we have talked about um, climate justice and youth-led movements. Um, Youth are our future. They are our future leaders. They are the ones who we work for. They are highly underrepresented in our common spaces. And I would offer, there are other voices and communities that we need in this room and more broadly in philanthropy. So while we continue to work towards being this sort of minority majority nation, um, there is urgency and opportunity to make sure that we have the kind of representation we need. So that's kind of the one D I would offer. The second, and I think when we convene again in 2025, 
um, disinformation will be an issue that I worry will have happened in the time since we met. And disinformation is um, in that messy space of technology, things we don't really understand, uh, media, but it is corrosive to our ability to sit in the public square and have civilized conversations without repercussions. Um, and so I would urge us to think about this intersectional space of disinformation as an area of funding and learning in the coming years. Um, and then the third D, this is a small one, but maybe important. Can I just see a quick show of hands? Who here represents uh, the donor advised funds or donor advised funds? So again, small, pers uh, small group of folks, uh, very happy to have you here. Um, today, uh, there's about $250 billion uh, sitting in donor advised funds. That is one fifth of the assets of uh, endowed philanthropy, you know, about 1.3 million. That's pretty significant and it will c only continue to grow. Um, and I think we think of DAFs as vehicles, just places where sort of money is sitting around. Uh, but if we could reimagine sort of the role of these, um, uh, this trapped philanthropic capital that we can liberate, that we can collectively access, perhaps we can open the aperture of what is possible for us. So those are the things that I might offer as things that we might explore um, over the next several years. That's great. And that, that was about the who. Uh, did you also have thoughts about the what we're talking about or not talking about? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, um, I applaud uh, uh, the, uh, everyone who put this program together. I know I personally wanted to teleport myself into sort of multiple sessions and look forward to hearing um, uh, the, the, the rest of the sessions. What a, a, a common theme I heard were intersectional issues. Um, and I think that we are still in philanthropy organized by our silos. And I worry that we continue to become more atomized as we um, uh, find ourselves in spaces of people along similar issues, perhaps similar segments within philanthropy, family philanthropy versus, uh, uh, let's say, uh, corporate philanthropy. Um, and I think we should resist the temptation to move into our sort of respective silos and lean into the discomfort of going to places where um, not everybody maybe thinks a little bit like us, not everybody is necessarily in our convening, my sense is that is where the most creative ideas come from. Um, let's sample across movements, let's sample across segments, let's sample across issues to find those set of shared solutions. Love, love, love all that, very helpful. Any reactions? I, I think that's a great list. I'm gonna go way on a tangent. Do I don't it. know how to make this a D, but <laughs> uh, the snacks. <laughs> we need afternoon snacks. Okay, oh. all right, all right. Oh, I did. <laughs> Sweet and savory snacks. So in 2025, the Colorado Health Foundation will be the official snack sponsor oh, all right. of <laughs> the You Health heard it here, folks. <laughs> These are going to be some pricey snacks. Delicious. Uh, there we go. Delicious. He gave me the D. Delicious. Delicious. <laughs> I, maybe I'll switch gears a little bit. But, uh, talk about a different kind of atomization or... Um, which is just in our country, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so this came up in the democracy plenary, which was fascinating mm -hmm. uh, on every level. Uh, what was said, even the body language was fascinating. You know, th th these are folks who are all uh, coming at the issue in a slightly different way. Um, and, and they had a great discussion, so ably moderated by Kristen Campbell from Pace. I think, a, struggle that I'm hearing folks talk about all the time is what is philanthropy's role in building bridges? And when are, and what is a bridge too far? Uh, it, when are we acting in a way that recognizes that it takes broad coalitions to get things done? And when might we be normalizing extremism uh, and, and how to know that when we see it, you know? And I suspect that this also plays out differently locally than it does nationally. So um, again, to start with the, the two of you and then come to Sampriti, as local leaders, I, I have a couple of questions. Are you, are you as despondent uh, <laughs> as I am about, about the degree to which um, 
folks don't seem to be talking to each other or do you see signs of hope at, at the local level? What do you see as your foundation's role, if any, uh, in terms of polarization and how do you build bridges without inadvertently you know, platforming or normalizing views that we should be drawing a line and saying that's sort of out of bounds of civil society? This is where I think that conversation intersects with the whole philanthropic pluralism mm -hmm. conversation, which just creates all kinds of cognitive dissonance for me. So for, to the democracy conversation, and that conversation the other day, when um, Danielle was talking about we need to create the supermajority. Well, we're all trying to create a supermajority, but not the same supermajority. Right. And I, and I think to, the pluralism argument requires that we all have the same goal, which I don't think we all do you know, across the philanthropic spectrum. And even more than that, I think it requires that we have the all assumptions. And if we just screw off our heads and look inside and see what are the assumptions behind our goals, they'd be very different. So I don't know how we ever do this when we start with such different assumptions. So we, at the Colorado Health Foundation, you know, there's the 20% that will, that are lost to us and our, and our, and, uh, and our assumptions and our way of thinking. So we're not worried about that 20%. But we are trying to figure out how do we have, how do we create um, civil conversation? How do we advance the, the conversation and the narrative amongst the people who are just curious, who are not even sure what they believe, right. but would have a conversation. And I don't think we can, and our approach has not been, this would be a stumble from the other, the other um, session. The approach is not to tell them how stupid they are, how dumb they are, how ignorant they are. That wouldn't ever invite, that would never bring me to the table if someone was just gonna insult me. So we don't yet, have the individual or institutional language to still sit st steeply in our beliefs and use language that would invite people into the conversation rather than incite them to run away screaming. And so we're still trying to learn how to do that. And we think that's our role. How do we, how do we advance public discourse? and give people information that they can actually make their own minds. And we think if they have the right information or enough information that they will uh, lean towards the social justice side, lean towards, well, yes, everybody should have a fair chance of winning. Uh, and so that's how we, that's how we think our, see our role. And, but it is, I think there is a bridge too far. I think there's a bridge too far for the Colorado Health Foundation. I think the, the, just accepting whole cloth of plural, pluralism is maybe a bridge too far for, for us. Thank you. Dick, how do you think about it? I, I really like what you said, Karen. I don't have a whole lot to add because I think that's largely how we think about it too. Um, it gets to how we, and I, I struggle with the word tension when I, I actually call these creative tensions because I think, I think that's, recognizing that that's the water that we swim in, in some cases, working across the spectrum of these issues. And this is the one I named as convener, bridge builder, on the one hand, advocate for sometimes uncomfortable, urgent change on the other. And that can get, that can get tricky. I remember when I came into the field 10, 12 years ago, kind of the pinnacle of civic leadership in community foundations was convening people with disparate views. But when, what was the purpose of doing that? Was that actually creating coalition efforts that was gonna advance significant sy systemic change? And I know that foundations felt when they then perhaps stepped out of the lane a little bit of trying to create the perfect consensus solution, sometimes people say, now wait a minute, we thought you were a neutral, objective convener, you were just setting the table. And there's a tension there for building bridges, bring, trying to um, shed more light than heat 
and the, in this terribly divisive and polarized society, but at times having to step out of that and saying things and doing things that elements in our community are going to really disagree with. And that's, that's, an, uncomfortable situ that's an uncomfortable position for foundations. The only thing I'll add is, so we always think about the tools, and it's not nine. I love Jacob's nine, as I said before, but we think of four tools that we have to bring to any challenge, and it includes the challenge of talking across differences, trying to get people to understand each other, and of course it's grants. That's the, think of these as capital, that's the financial capital, and we fund a lot of other organizations who are doing remarkable bridge building at the local level. It doesn't have to be us. Then there is human and social capital. That's the relationships within our foundation, with our partners, with community. The third type of capital is political capital. And I mean small p to advance policy change. Um, and many of us have spent years building up that political capital and we need to spend some of it um, at these times of poly crisis. And then the fourth, increasingly I see, is using our invested capital, our assets, and really putting our assets, our invested assets to work. So when we think about bridge building, when we think about talking across difference, which of those capitals, is it our human capital and social capital, or can we um, create the conditions and support other organizations who might be actually better positioned to do that because of some of the trust than our foundation itself. Can I add two things to that? Yeah. I think it was at this conference a few years ago, uh, I heard someone describe what you just described as foundations have to use their cash and cachet. Mm, and so I've, yeah. that, that's one I've, I've latched onto. And I was gonna say, I don't think the conversation of building the bridge is all an external conversation. I, I will speak for myself, I think it's an internal conversation as well because we have the tension inside the organization of there's the organizational perspective that may not align with individual perspectives on how we should be thinking about and approaching equity. And so we have to have our own internal conversation about, yes, the spectrum is this wide, but the organization is taking this, this focus. And yes, reparations is an option, but that is not the organizational perspective and so I think that there is that I don't know if there are many or major divides within our organizations that we also have to bridge. Right. Could I just add to that because for my community foundation colleagues in the room of course internal bridges with staff and board and volunteers but then we're working with hundreds of living donors every week and every month as well so we have that whole dynamic um, as well. Sam Preeti, you've thought a lot about this and we've had some kind of intense conversations about it. Can you share a little bit how you think about it? Yeah, and I'll, I'll share a contrarian perspective, which is I have never been more hopeful about democracy here. Um, and, and why do I share that? Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, I um, grew up um, in the Philippines under martial law and I lived in India during the emergency period where there were major suspensions of civil rights. Um, and the ability to exercise your franchise was highly limited. Uh, when I came to the United States at the age of 18, I was a US citizen, I was born here, um, uh, I was amazed um, and honored, quite frankly, to have the ability to vote, and I voted in every single election for the last 30 years, and so I would offer each of you one measure of hope, which is, um, we asked for five words yesterday, democracy begins with me. Um, and I offer each of you the agency to exercise your franchise. We are 368 odd days away from a national election. And so if you are ever feeling despair about your sort of the state of our democracy, know that you have agency in this particular choice and decision. So that's just one thing I would offer um, at, a, at a sort of uh, system level. Some of the greatest experiments and participation in democracy we see is at the state level as well as at the local and municipal level. And for those of you who fund C4 organizations, I will just offer that there has been kind of a, a collective energy 
in the sort of C4 uh, infrastructure um, uh, and movement building in ways and spaces that we have not seen to date. My ask for funders is to continue to fund that type of movement building and that organizing at the state level. Um, some of the greatest sort of democratic inventions we see happen at states and then they get exported and transplanted to other states in our federal system. So um, I, I would just offer that maybe not as uh, a reason to care less, but to actually find sort of pots of solutions um, 2020 was a high watermark in terms of participation in the election. We got to close to 60% participation. There's another 40% of our electorate that can still be mobilized and energized. So I would encourage an offer that we can look for white spaces while we continue to grapple with hyperpartisan um, sort of issues that stand before us. Um, and I think the fact that funders are getting into, as Ada Lamon said, the messy is actually a good thing for us. It's a zone of discomfort, but I'm optimistic that five, 10, 20 years from now, we can look back and say philanthropy had a pivotal, consequential role to play and feel proud of our collective investments in this area. Yeah, I mean, when, when, when Karen was talking about the, the cache comment, it made me think of something that I think Fred Blackwell said, and when I was, that his mother used to say, Angela Glover Blackwell, and I hope I'm quoting it right, but said something like, you know, if you care about your reputation, like you take all this time to worry about your reputation as a person, as an institution, what's the point of having it if you're not gonna use it, right? And, and, and I do think, um, you know, one critique of, of institutional philanthropy is, is sometimes it feels, certainly to nonprofits, and, and again, to channel some of the organizations at the breakout that I led yesterday, they feel like, look, folks are coming for us, and this goes back to your point um, about legal support, other kinds of support. People are coming for us. We don't have what our funders have in terms of the resources to, to take risks, to be out there, um, we have to be more cautious, but funders have the opportunity to use some of that, that capital in all its various forms, uh, both monetary and reputational. Um, do, I mean, do you think that institutional philanthropy is doing a good enough job of stepping into the issues that need to be addressed? I didn't say I was gonna ask only easy questions. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even no. I'll just say no. <laughs> We're not. I, some of that is fear of fear of risk. Some of that is fear of blowback from the community or from the board. Some of that is not knowing how. Uh, and some of that is all good intentions and just maybe being um, ham handed in our in our approach, but I yeah. think I'd probably put most of it at reticence and um, some fearfulness. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Tick? I do, yeah. and, but when I hear institutional philanthropy, I go back to, like, what do I, my experience, um, because I'm not sure, I, I'm not, definitely not qualified to make any sweeping statements about institutional philanthropy. Um, I have, I, so my, this is just my own experience. I have had organizations, BIPOC-led organizations, leaders, friends, neighbors of color in New Hampshire say to me, yes, we don't, we're scared. We have been verbally um, assaulted. Um, I have friends who've been threatened for speaking the truth. And what they've said is, Dick is a, you know, a white male baby boomer with privilege when you stand up and say systemic racism exists in this state and you risk um, losing donors by saying that, you risk some of your objectivity and neutrality supposedly, that gives us some cover. Mm -hmm. 
And that's, we're, that's not why I say these things. It's not why we're centering equity and racial justice, but knowing that that's one of the things, a role that I can play as a 60 something white guy, um, I'm happy to take that because if I feel a little unsafe doing that, it, it, is, it pales in comparison to the physical and emotional safety of my brown and black friends and colleagues. Um, and it's like, space, so. dude, boy, if we can't speak the truth, right, about what the data shows us yeah. about systemic racism and systemic inequities, yeah. we're in serious trouble. And that, that relates, again, to this sort of organized effort, you know, to, to literally deny our history, right, in, right. in, some, in, in many states, an increasing number of, of states, and, um, and, and, you know, how foundations counter, counter that uh, is, is a, whole, a whole other question, and I, I hesitate to go there because I, don't, I doubt we have the answers, uh, but, uh, but it's, it's scary. Right, uh, and, and, um, and I think I would just observe just anecdotally, well, first I'll start with the research. We documented real shifts in foundation's engagement with issues of racial equity, and it manifested in a variety of forms post-2020, changes in practices, um, changes in who was funded, uh, in interviews, discussion about the relationship between programmatic, programmatic goals and strategies in a variety of different program areas, and systemic racism. I can't tell you that we have the longitudinal data because we don't, but anecdotally, I can tell you a lot of folks feel that there is some you know, real pullback, and, and I know we've touched on this already, but, and, and feel that their boards are not where they were. You know? And, and so, so the reason I bring this up again is because it then goes right back to this issue of courage and leaders actually being willing you know, to take some risk, right? And, and, and to risk, you know, take some career risk. I mean, if we can't some, take some career risk, for crying out loud, you know? So, um, all right, I wanna end at a different place. Um, Karen, on our pre-call um, to, to get organized, um, quoted, I think, Bill Gates, we decided, the internet told us it was, uh, anyway. It, who, any number of people might have said this, but um, that um, we often overestimate what can be done in the short term, but underestimate what can be done in the long term. And, you know, we started to talk about some of the things that have changed that people thought weren't going to change. And so I'd like you each, if you could, to just talk about um, something in, that, that you think philanthropy helped change for the better. That, and it can be tiny. Uh, from your, you know, your community, or it could be big. Um, and it, what comes to mind uh, for, for each of you? Sampriti, you want to start on this one? Come back to me on this one. Yeah, Sorry. sure. Well, one thing I think philanthropy has changed for the, for the better is um, that it's um, made this career this field, a, a career for people like me, people like every other person of color in this, in this room, every other woman in this room, uh, because, you know, even 20 years ago when I came into philanthropy, I was like, where are all the black people? <laughs> um, where are any brown people? And so just the fact that the field itself has opened up to a diverse audience is something we've done within the field, which can only have great external impact. Yeah, and then in terms of, Karen, just sticking with you for a minute, in terms of external impact on communities or issues, either in Colorado or nationally, is there anything that comes to mind as something you take inspiration from? Well, I, I'm also all, always looking for the the organizations in community that community trusts, and they are not necessarily the, the brand name nonprofits that exist in every community. But I think philanthropy has really started to shine a light on and help, mo help communities move themselves when the people that are serving the community, when they close up and go home in the afternoon, they don't, they don't drive to another neighborhood. 
they drive down the street right. to their house. And so I think the focus on uh, community, I think the focus on beginning to listen to community uh, is really something that philanthropy has done and can do. Uh, I would em encourage folks not to celebrate too much if your community engagement is an event, if listening community is an event, um, I wouldn't pat ourselves too much on the back. It has to be our way of being. It has to be standard operating procedure in our organizations. But I think the, we've, we've turned our focus really externally and not um, relied so much on ourselves and our own expertise and wisdom. And that has been community. a shift. That is absolutely a shift. I mean, if you looked at conference programs 15 years ago and how many of them were focused on more sort of top-down mm -hmm. uh, designed, you know, with by consultants in khakis in a conference room as opposed to informed by community strategies, it feels, it feels really different now. Dick, what comes to mind for you? Um, I'm going to say philanthropies, as I understand it, philanthropies response in the first six months of COVID I think is something that I'm proud of what we did as a foundation. We changed everything. We changed our relationships. We changed our processes. Um, actually, our next DPR really showed a lot of that. We didn't do it because, or GPR, we didn't do it for that reason, obviously. But, and then when I listen to um, colleagues and friends around the country, not only in those first three to six months, but then reimagining one example, our relationship in helping government get money to ground more quickly. The things that are happening in community foundations around the country of partnering with government um, to make sure that those federal funds are being informed by the people in the communities and being vectors for that and then levering that with our own sorts of capital. I think that was a really big win for philanthropy. And I know that, and you guys know from some of the study, that a lot of the changes we had to make in that urgency of the moment, we're not unchanging those. We're not unchanging the overemphasis on applications and reporting and and uh, taking way too long to cut checks and all of that because there was, we were forced out of, the, in, out of that moment to look really hard at those things, change them, and we're not going back. And that's something I'm proud of for our foundation, but even more so when I hear and, and uh, learn about even bolder things that many of, of you did during that moment of crisis. Thanks, Dick. I'll go a little bit uh, ba deeper back in history because one of the great benefits and one of the frustrations of philanthropy is the long horizon. Um, and I always think about the but for test, but for philanthropy, there would not have been a green revolution that helped to uh, reduce uh, 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 or uh, uh, food security uh, across much of the globe. But for philanthropy, there would not be a World Health Organization, the eventual uh, forerunner uh, to sort of helping to address major um, sort of diseases. But for philanthropy and US philanthropy, there would not have been the last mile eradication of smallpox from India, which is where I am from. Um, and there are these moments, and we may need to excavate deeper in our history to find those moments of hope and inspiration, and in so doing, uh, I invite us to challenge perhaps the ways in which we approach those solutions, but also be inspired by the fact that today, each of you is potentially sitting in a position where 30, 50, maybe 100 years from now, we can look back and say, but for philanthropy. And so that's an invitation that I think all of us who sit in these positions of privilege have while we grapple with the, the despair and the despondency that very much sort of fills our hearts in these moments as well. What a great way to finish. Um, and I think the but fours go on and on. I mean, and, I, and we've talked about this and, and, and you know, there's, there's so many of them and that's important to remember and, and learn from. Uh, before I thank the panel, I'm to tell you that a survey, of course, is coming from us about this conference. Uh, we would love you to fill that out um, and uh, would appreciate the feedback. So grateful to each of you who traveled from all over the world and all across the country uh, to be here for your engagement, your thoughtfulness, and Dick, 
Karen and Sam Preeti, thank you each for helping us kind of process this conference real time. Thank you. Thank you.